The Smithsonian Faculty Fellowship Program represents a rewarding academic professional development opportunity for faculty at Montgomery College. The fellowships are a product of a unique collaboration between Montgomery College and the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access. It's the first of its kind between the Smithsonian Institution and a community college. Amanda Buxbaum is a professor of nutrition at Montgomery College and does nutritional consulting as a Maryland licensed nutritionist for the Village Green, Spectracell Laboratories, and Learn, Feel, Choose Nutrition, the company for which she is the founder and owner. She works with clients with a full range of nutritional issues such as weight loss, fitness, diabetes, HBP, arthritis, Lyme, and cancer, but has a special interest in neurological disorders such as autism, depression, ADHD, anxiety, Alzheimer's, MS, and ALS. She brings a deep analytical angle to her work, coming from the actuarial profession and math teaching, both at the Murray School in DC and in Liberia with the Peace Corps. But her most central focus is kindness. Amanda has a gentle, personal, individualized approach, both with her nutrition clients and her students. I am so happy to be here. I am Amanda Buxbaum. As a nutritionist and a teacher, I am a change agent, helping people make changes for the better, changes which contribute to greater health, vitality, and freedom from disease. What changes help to produce these amazingly positive effects? Our food choices, says the nutritionist. <laughs> I explored food choices this year in my 2015 Smithsonian Faculty Fellowship Project. How do we make our food choices? Or more importantly, how do we make our healthier food choices? In four ways from our personal experiences, from what we learn, like in my class, from our parents and culture, like your immigration story and cultural heritage, and from our evolutionary history, like what we saw in the museum. How far back in time should we go for information about our healthier food choices? As recently as now, this very moment as you're sitting here in this room, feeling now in the context of your current choices in as far back as our evolutionary history, which we will explore in the museum. This, the theme this year is I too am American, understanding the American immigrant experience. So I asked my students, what is their American immigrant experience? Well, typically they told me they gain weight, they get sick, they go on short and long-term medications, and they go on psychiatric medications. And this is not some unusual class, and this was not <coughs> one class. This is what I typically hear from my students when we talk about health, when they talk about their immigration experiences, their own, their parents and grandparents, and their friends. It is so statistically significant that there is a name for it, the Hispanic paradox. Typically, better health correlates with better education and higher income. Yet, recent Hispanic immigrants experience better health with, on average, lower educational and income levels. Immigrants start off healthier, yet become less healthy the longer they live here until in about five years, their health status approaches that of an American-born citizen. What made them healthier and what is making them sicker? There are many possible reasons. However, I will talk here about their better food. What makes their food better when they first arrive? It is more natural and less processed with fewer added chemicals. And what is worse about food in America? It is less natural with more processing. There is something worse in America? Immigrants come here hoping to find the best of everything, and indeed, they find the best food, don't they? According to Cecilia, a recent immigrant from Africa, her first meal in the United States was a Big Mac meal from McDonald's. She said that this meal was the most delicious food 
that she had ever tasted. And she knew that moving to the United States was going to be wonderful. Yet, with the most delicious food that Cecilia had ever tasted, she gained a lot of weight and became sick and depressed. Where do you turn when you experience problems in the promised land? Immigrants might respond, I too am American, but I do not want to be sick to prove it. <laughs> I want much of what America can provide, but I do not want the predicted ill health. We can acculturate in two directions. Immigrants can acculturate to the American diet and lifestyle and the accompanying disease status which goes along with that. Or the American diet and lifestyle can change slowly over time and become positively affected by the ideas and practices of, of the best of the immigrant diet and lifestyle. We can welcome our immigrants and all eat together at McDonald's and drink sodas. All together, together as Americans and get sicker and fatter together unified in the American experience. Oops. Or we can change the American experience of food. One way of doing this is to adopt some of the best of the immigrant lifestyle practices. Let us do that. Let us learn what our immigrants have to teach us. I pay really close attention when my student starts a sentence with, in my country, we. I learn from my students every day. I learn about different cultures, foods, and ways in which people respond to symptoms and cure diseases. From listening to my students' comments, I have stretched my own thinking about nutrition and healing, and I've used some of their insights from their extremely diverse cultural backgrounds to motivate and augment my professional investigations into the current medical and nutritional scientific literature. I believe the answers to our society's most difficult health and disease challenges will come from health wisdom shared between cultures. And only one of these cultures is that of white lab coats and inside lab research buildings and hospitals. It may be that many of our current medical problems will include the insights and vast wisdom from our immigrants. I have an assignment to help my students focus on the health practices which they have learned in their home, which is a culture itself, and in their culture. I have them write down the health practice, where it's from, and what they use it for. I use this form, and I get answers. For, for example, golden milk from India. It is a warm, honey-sweetened milk with lots and lots of the herb turmeric. With turmeric being profoundly anti-inflammatory, it produces a positive effect on most disease processes. And by the way, it tastes fabulous. I love it. And from this, using the scientific concepts that underlie this simple cultural practice, even I've created 20 other medicinally effective variations on this practice. This healing cultural wisdom can be expressed in a huge variety of ways and have a huge reach and can help many people. It should be a part of our American lifestyle and our American health care system. We should all enjoy golden milk. Another one is moringa leaves from Africa for energy and constitution made into a delightful tea. I want the health status of the, Ameri of the average American to be raised up to the health status of recent immigrants and higher. How do we do this? By asking, listening, and incorporating. Ask our new immigrants about their lives, their lifestyle, their food, their feelings, their values, how they put their lives together into a balanced and unified whole with food. Listen and then incorporate that which feels good into your own life, into your American life, slowly changing one tiny item at a time. Back to food, wait, let me see where I am. Back to food choices. 
Certainly we can learn from our healthier um, immigrants. There are four primary motivators for our healthier food. Places where we turn for answers. To yourself, feeling, sensing, exploring your N equals one experiments. Write down what you eat, write down how you feel. Start the science which is in your kitchen, your heart, and in your very cells. To science, take my class, read, research. And to your ethnic heritage and the ethnic heritage of others. And to our evolutionary history. And to that end, my students explored our evolutionary history at the Museum of Natural History. Field trip. I gave my students the necessary logistics and off we went to the Origin of Man exhibit. We found things like this. This display motivated my use of this exhibit. It is among the very worst museum displays that I've seen. It combines elements of the absurd, the misleading, and the brilliant, perfect from my class. With a fearless application of the tool of logic, let the classroom discussions begin. We explored the museum with worksheets used to motivate critical thinking. Here are some questions from the worksheet. List three reasons why that pizza on the right might not represent our food heritage of the last 50,000 years. It is complex to have perspective over long time frames, so we explored time lines to get that perspective. We use timelines in the museum, in our classroom, and in their homework assignments. We looked at timelines with a very, very long scale of years, seven million years here. We Homo sapiens are one of those tiny red specks at the very, very top. We looked at tighter time frames with just our genus, the genus Homo, looking at developing human traits. This timeline tracked an even tighter time frame, the time frame of our species, Homo sapiens, since 200,000 years ago. And finally, this was the time frame which tracked us just back to the beginning of agriculture. Our change of diet due to agriculture was that important. Agriculture changed everything. With agriculture, our population grew. With increased populations came cities and rich cultural creations. With the increased Population and the new diet from agriculture also came new diseases. The greater the population, the greater the magnificent cultural expressions. But along with that came new health challenges, and we explored these ideas. We did a classroom timeline too, which filled up two walls. The students added information to it for extra credit. It stretched the whole way across the room, two walls in three million years, one inch at a time. Students got points for adding facts, theories, images, and with that filled in graphic that stretched through our classroom, we had an amazing visual to reference for class discussions. For example, we talked about when the first regular use of controlled fire might have started. Was it just 300,000 years ago? or one and a half million years before that. This is a massive range that the experts are debating. Well, if the experts have such differences of opinion, we are then free in the classroom to say what is on our minds and to have our opinions. This produced amazing classroom conversation and engagement. No one had to worry about being right because there was no wrong here. And my students engaged and did their own timeline. It was completely free form using what they learned from class and from the museum. If a student got stuck, I asked that they simply correct the dates on the following timeline and fill in a few more items. Let's see, we have Austral Australopithecus, did nothing, Homo habilis, tool use, Homo erectus, fire, Homo neanderthalensis, funerals, Homo sapiens, iPhone 6. <laughs> and with this as a starting point, the students could then relax and be more confident that they really are free to do their timeline in their own style. And the free form idea goes global. I asked them to imagine adding something great to the museum exhibits which they saw. 
They are now the experts, the museum curators. I asked them to draw a display that they would like to see and to draw it and describe it. This one compares a food pyramid from 50,000 years ago to one recommended today. Which one should we strive for to stay healthy? Biologically, we're very similar today to 50,000 years ago. Here's a whimsical one, which I like, family bonding over the puzzle of figuring out how to eat an actual whole food. <laughs> what do we do with this? Family bonding. And indeed, the museum missed pulling together their timelines into one timeline so that the relative magnitude of years could be better understood. This was the offering of another student. And what I was striving for as well for the classroom timeline, perspective, time perspective. Now we make it all personal. How can all that we've learned in the classroom be used to improve our lives? I asked my students to write their health truths discovered from each of the four sources for healthier food choices. Their personal experiences, healthy cultural practices, and our evolutionary history and scientific literature like I bring to the classroom. Here are some of the results. In the category of personal observations, students noted their individual responses and experiences. For example, noting how they feel, they said some of the following. I become bloated when I eat gluten. I am allergic to eggs. I get brain fog and can't stay awake. I feel energe energetic when I drink coffee at first. <laughs> then it stops working so well. In the category of healthy cultural practices, students noted golden milk calms me and keeps me healthy. I eat rice and beans together, and then they learned that that food combination is a great way to get higher quality protein. I eat fermented foods like sauerkraut and kimchi, and then they learned that indeed fermented foods are good for their gut health. A great deal of the time, it turns out that science validates the health and nutritional value of, of traditional cultural practices. Input to the category of healthy ideas from our evolutionary history came mostly from what they learned from their museum trip. Like, I eat a varied diet, and indeed, human species were opportunistic eat eaters, and we spoke about that. They ate what they could find, and this changed daily, seasonally, yearly, and generationally. I am usually grain-free. Indeed, grains did not come into our diet until extremely recently. I skip breakfast. It is, it is likely that some time passed in the morning before our ancestors ate their first food of the day. The words processed food are usually stated as a negative, but sometimes our science and modern technology can bring us beneficial processed foods and nutritional choices. In the category of scientific literature, modern technology, and government recommendations might include, I use an, I paraphrase these, I use an easy to digest protein from a highly processed whey protein powder. And indeed, whey protein powders can effectively help improve our protein status, even though they are highly processed. I use highly processed nutritional supplements, and indeed, some supplements can be extremely beneficial, even though they are highly processed. Government, what do we get from government? Well, Michelle motivates me to consider and try new things. Someone in my class said they will miss Michelle Obama. Who will be our next motivator for healthy living? Summary, my students are making better and healthier choices. That's the essential. My summary, my actual summary, is that I'm making better and healthier choices too. Student ex students explored collaboratively. Students contribute to a class timeline, and they contributed to a notebook with information about healthy practices from different cultures so we could all see what each one wrote about their healthy traditional ways. And in the future, I envision a notebook with personal experiences on various topics to capture the wisdom of individuals as well. Also in the future, this, 
Also in the future, this project lends itself easily to an interdisciplinary class connecting the academic disciplines of nutrition science, anthropology, biology, sociology, graphic design, history, gender studies, and probably many more. Ah, here are some of my beautiful students enjoying the museum. We had a great time. Thank you.